Major funding for The Great American Quilt is provided by American School of Needlework Incorporated, publisher of books in all areas of needlework. By Lehman Publishing, publisher of Quilter's Newsletter Magazine, the magazine for quilt lovers. By Fairfield Processing Corporation, maker of polyfill brand products for crafting. By RGR Fashion Fabrics, where innovation is a tradition. By New Home, changing the way America sews. And by Keepsake Quilting, publishers of the Keepsake Quilting Catalog, the Quilter's Wishbook. I'm glad you're back. I wanted to start by reading you a quote that I love that is not about sampler quilts, which we're going to talk about today, but about those embroidered samplers. This was written in 1800 by a girl who wrote on her sampler, Patty Polk did this, and she hated every stitch she did in it. She loves to read much more. So I hope you're enjoying your sampler blocks. I wanted to start by showing you some blocks that look like they might have been made for a sampler quilt. A friend sent me a bunch of blocks, and I've got the whole pile here, and I've laid some of them out. And as I was taking them out of the bag, I started noticing things about them. Some of them were really quite dirty, and they were all different sizes, and they were, well, quite frankly, they aren't real lookers as far as blocks are concerned. They're a little dingy, and some of them aren't even very well made, which I was still really grateful for the gift, but I was a little puzzled. So what I did was call a friend who specializes in block collections, Willene Smith. She's from Wichita, and one of the nice things about the current quilt movement is if you don't know something, you can usually get on the phone and call someone that does. Willene has about 800 blocks in her collection. And she told me that what I have here is a collection of blocks that was never intended to be in a quilt at all, but was really a block collection. She said that toward the end of the 1900s and the beginning, toward the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, women made blocks like this and collected them just to collect the patterns, much like people would collect baseball cards or anything. And so they're not well made often. They were made just as examples, and sometimes they were even written on. Here's one from Willene's collection, and you can see that the maker has written on it, actually. It's a staggering figure, 1,764, and that's the number of these little dark triangles that she would have to make. So you can tell this was never made to be in a quilt, or she wouldn't be writing on it. Here is an ex another example of kind of a poorly made sample block along with the blocks that the woman made originally for her quilt. Much uh, better in construction. This was just an example. So if you find a collection, if you are going through things in an old house of your family's and find a block collection, what should you do with it? Well, I guess what I would like you to know is that it's possible it isn't in a quilt because it was never made to be in a quilt. If you find a collection, maybe just keep it as it is. It's a real treasure just the way it is. Now it's time for you to take the blocks that you've done and look with Laura and Diana at some things to think about when you're putting them together in your collection, in your quilt. I think I'm going to put the house right in the middle. Laura, that's a good choice. Yeah. Oftentimes yeah. it works real well in this position. Uh -huh. What about the tree there? Yeah, it's, it's OK for right now. Let's take a look, though. Play with it. We have all of our blocks laid out here on our table, and we want you to go get your blocks and maybe just let them go out on your living room floor and let's take a look at them. Look what you've done. Isn't this great? <laughs> let's organize these blocks and uh, uh, maybe organize them as far as color and mm. design. Mm -hmm. So if you have what we call heavy blocks, that means those that are <laughs> deep and dark in color, 
Let's make a pile of those. Okay. Well, obviously this log cabin will be one of those. And maybe yeah. the memory, we've got both the red and the blue here. Mm -hmm. Looks like you've got some blues there. And, and let's start add a little. blue and uh, two color combinations. And here's two, co two warm colors. Right. Oh, that's good. Okay. And I'm let's... Going to, I'm going to arrange some of these hearts together. You have uh, six blocks that are already 12-inch squares, but you will need to make three more of them. Mm -hmm. So you've got a total of nine for the center of the quilt. So you can have these um, to play with with your six-inch blocks. Oh, it's nice just to get these blocks out, though, to have to just look at them so you can see exactly mm -hmm. whether or not they're light and airy, like the heart, or whether or not they're a little heavier. Because we want to show you now, over on our design board, you can see that we've got ours up. Yeah. And let's put some of these up on the design board. OK. I'm going to take the log cabin. And I usually like to try this one in a corner. Now, it mm -hmm. may not stay there, but because the weight that Diana mentioned works real well in a corner position. Do we have something that mm -hmm. might balance that? Maybe this one. Could mm -hmm. that work up there? Sure. Let's try this one up in this Give corner. This is a good corner block. This design board is just uh, made from a piece of uh, wool felt. And you can make one for your own, uh, your own studio. Now, this area. Uh, Right there. Let's try this one to match oh, up the log cabin that has strips down. Do you and have another blue there? I do. Maybe do I, I can that balance that, mm -hmm. and maybe this can balance off that tree. Mm -hmm. Let's see. How is that looking over there? Oh, I like it. Let's try I like another, that. Let's take this one. Okay. Another airy feeling one. Mm -hmm. Going to put that on the top. Let me just see what that looks like. Oh, yes. Good. That good. looks really good because oh, now good. can you see that I've got this kind of balance going oh, with just the red and the white. What about this here? Does that work? It just yeah, might. It matches the airiness of that. Might. Let's turn this heart so Whoops, upside down. Of course. Notice that I've divided the warm and the cool colors together. Now we need to add some borders around this. Let's, Let's just put up some of these. Okay. Uh, the corners mm, now are still a, a real design interest here. So the heart or the, the stars. star works really well. For Do you have those. a star mm -hmm. there? Maybe you could try one of those. I'm going to place this. Let's see. Want the pinwheels? Maybe we can uh, balance off and alternate the uh, the reds and the blues. Now, obviously, we're just playing around with this right now, and it. It looks pretty easy, but this is something that you'll want to work with. I like to put it up on a wall and let it sit there for a couple days and rearrange it and play around with it. it seems to uh, change every time I look at it. And you can oh, that's good. Cause little areas to form designs like the two flying geese together mm -hmm. and maybe separated with a pinwheel. Right. Oh, look at that, Diana. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's good. Mm hmm. Now take your reducing glass. This glass here reduces the image so it makes it smaller and I can really look and, and have some decisions whether or not I want to change different ones. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the log cabin up in the far corner. Or something. Maybe you'd want to put this one there. What do you think? Uh, no. The other one works better, doesn't yeah, it? it does. I think it balances off the other opposite corner. Mm -hmm. That's good. Once you've come up with a, an arrangement that you like, um, if you have a Polaroid camera, it works real well. You can take a snapshot of it, and it gives you a better viewing of what yes. this quilt's going to look like. So yeah. continue to put up your blocks and arrange them and have a good time with them. Yeah. You'll like this part. It really part. is. In our classes, this is always <laughs> the most exciting one, isn't right, it? Right, it is. Now, this is just a top done by Tricia Thomas, but notice that it her center interest of design. Mm -hmm. She put her heavy block right there in the center and this is multiple colors. Now a lot of you will have multiple color quilts mm -hmm. and notice how she has balanced all of her color just going every which way in this one. Now we want to show you that we're going to set the quilt together into rows. Right. Can you see I'm going to call this row one which is uh, a series of the small border blocks and then row two join two of the small blocks together and then this entire strip becomes row two. And then of course row three, row four, mm -hmm. and row five are the last of the, uh, the small six inch blocks. 
Should we add some borders to this one? Oh, yes. Okay. This one needs borders, especially all this busy design mm -hmm. area going, the color all interacting mm -hmm. and working together. We want to just sort of give oh. this some kind of Won't this be nice? establishment. Oftentimes I use a dark, but I like this light border on I here. I like it too. Let's it's just different. It's uh, when you uh, add your borders, though, this is real important that you not just cut a strip of fabric and simply sh sew it onto the quilt. This, what will happen if you do is that you're going to end up with the, uh, the edges will flare out. So you need to find out what the measurement is. And this of the one's center. 47 inches. And the other one, we would take the measurement in the opposite direction and then use that measurement to determine the size, the finish size of each of the um, uh, lengths on border. And once you've established that, then you take the center point. Have you got that marked? Mm -hmm. I've got marked with this pin here. Good. And then I will come down half of the 47, 47 inches. 23 and a half. So you'll place a pin in opposite directions from that center point. And then the pins will be placed right on the corners. And you need to, there might be a little excess fullness in the quilt top, but you work that in. You make this quilt top fit onto the border. And then you'll have a nice square quilt. Should we look at some other border treatments? Yep. Oh, this one's wonderful. Just got some uh, little log cabins down there. Look at the log cabin corner logs. Mm -hmm. This gives good strong emphasis right here in the corner. And then she has used a border printed fabric. And you can do that too to form your designs and frame right with the fabric so you don't need to sew multiple colors together. This already comes printed just exactly like this. Isn't it great? It's a good use of that fabric. Look at this one. Oh, this was done by one of our students, Amy Turner. This was her first sampler quilt. And she chose to do corner blocks. Notice how she's got her corner blocks both with the inner border and the outer border. And she's machine quilted this. Mm, that's right. Also, it's a real nice use of solid fabric. So if you, if you enjoy working with those, it's a good uh, opportunity. Look at that. Oh. Karen McArdle. Yes. Oh. Oh. Now, her center interest is her original block that she made. Oh. Uh-huh. But let's go back out to this border here. And this light border just really frames this mm -hmm. quilt so well. And now she has a darker outer border that's very nicely and beautifully quilted by Anna Venti. Mm. And then she bound it, carrying out the green and repeating mm -hmm. that color back out in this very small edge. This really does frame and gives does. her quilt a real special feeling. Mm. The quilting in this one is just exquisite, isn't it? We're going to be covering quilting next week, so join us at the quilting frame. You bet. Okay, if you think you already know what you're going to do with your sampler, I'm going to give you just a couple of other ideas because I've got three gorgeous quilts that are new ones to show you. This is a group project, actually. It was inspired by an old Tennessee quilt that Betts Ramsey and Mary Kay Waldvogel found when they did a quilt project in Tennessee that searched all over the state. And they found this wonderful old 1870s sampler that inspired this contemporary sampler, which was done by their quilt group, which is, is the Thursday Bee. I think they must meet every Thursday morning of the Smoky Mountain Quilt Guild. They worked for a year and a half on this. And what's different about this that you can't see at first is that it's all made with hand-dyed fabrics. I find it amazing that you can get colors this beautiful from beads, beads, beets, I should say, and roots and berries. Jim Lyles, a zoology professor at the University of Tennessee, is their friend, and he dyed all this fabric for them and really got them going. All of the designs on this quilt are pre-1930s patterns that they had to draft by themselves, just as their grandmothers would have. So you can see one other advantage. Laura and Diana have been showing you how to draft quilts in earlier programs. You can see one of the other advantages of doing that. They could just look at old quilts and get the patterns on their own. This is the work of one woman. This is Cindy Vermillion Davis. She's from Pagosa Springs, Colorado. She's done this wonderful sampler, which is obviously a planned sampler. Some of the same designs that you have already seen are on this. These aren't Laura and Diana's blocks, but they're traditional blocks that you've already learned. The nine patch, you just saw the rail fence, 
Here's a house of her own design. And then down at the bottom, you probably know that that is log cabin. Here's one thing that I want you to see about this that is an idea that you might be able to use, this gorgeous lattice strip here. She's put corner blocks and then made a little star out of it that is in every corner. Now I want to show you a quilt that is kind of, uh, well, it's kind of like which twin has the Tony on this quilt because there are 20 blocks but only 10 designs. And it really shows the basis of quilts. You can start with just a few patterns and by putting the colors in different places, you get different effects. And I'm going to show you this by folding you it over because there's some quilts in this row that are just the same. There's some quilt blocks in this row that are just the same as the other row. This and this are the same pattern, as you can probably tell pretty easily. But would you believe that this block, which is all those half square triangles that Diane and Laura have been showing you, is actually the same as this block here. That's part of the fun of this. You start with certain blocks and you decide on the color and the pattern. This is one of the very few quilts that I'll be showing you during this section that does have patterns. This is by Paula Nadelstern, who's from the Bronx, and she's done a book. So watch the credits and you can see this. Now, I've asked Rod to go out and find us a sampler quilt and tell us a little bit more about it, so I'm going to be just as surprised as you are about what he finds. So you weren't able to find us a sampler? No, I wasn't. So I went into my own collection. Well, I knew you'd find something. And I brought a wonderful block that I really love because it was made by my great-grandmother. How nice that you've got something from her. This is beautiful. Thank you. Do you I, know much about her? Well, I've learned a little bit. My parents are doing some genealogy. Mm -hmm. but she was Anna Curlin before she married John Kirokoff in 1869. And the family history has that she made, there were 12 blocks that were made. I own does, the one. Does the family still have all 12? Yes. Oh. Oh, that neat. she made it before she was married. Uh -huh. And the fabrics, my knowledge of fabrics, are consistent with that, that they're beautiful examples of, of 18, circa 1860s Well, this fabrics. one is so surprising, this one over here, because it looks almost 1990s. It's 1860s. Yes, I mean, and, and a lot like of... camouflage almost. A lot of fabrics are, that we see from that period it's amazing that, yeah. that they look so modern. And the other interesting thing is how you can see that it was printed with, with several different prints mm -hmm. on it. Had, this, had one of these triangles just been cut from this fabric, you would think that that was what the whole fabric looked like. Yeah, and it's got little tiny, tiny pieces. These were difficult blocks to do, these circular designs. Quilt maker friends of mine tell me this, and when we were talking about the tops in the earlier program, um, I talked about how sometimes blocks or tops aren't finished. Mm -hmm. I think this one looks like it would have been very difficult to have actually laid out flat. It may not have quilted well, but I'm happy to have it just as it is. Well, I like the fact. Again, we're talking about something unfinished. It's great as is. It doesn't need to be made into a, you know, horror of horror's pillow or anything right, like that. Right, exactly. It's perfect as it is. One of the things that intrigued me when we looked at this quilt by the Smoky Mountain Quilt Guild was that they had used fabric dyeing to make their quilt look old. Now, that was something that I had never thought of. I was used to the idea of people dyeing contemporary quilts to make them look kind of new and fresh. So I knew then when I saw this quilt that you could use dyeing for anything to make it look mellow and old or to make it new. So I thought, who could come and show us some tips on dyeing that you could use in your own home? And I thought immediately of Jan Myers Newberry. I have admired her work since 1977 when I first saw it. And so she's here now. And she's going to show us what she does. And I think you're going to like this. Hi, Jan. Hi, Penny. I have noticed your quilts have changed a little bit. You used to do all solid oh, I did used to do all <laughs> solids. Yeah, I started out 14 years ago working with these gradated dark to light sequences and used those entirely in my quilts. Um, what I loved was the luminosity that was created and the um, three-dimensional visual effects. Um, 
And it was really simple to do once I figured out the mathematical formula for getting these gradated sequences. Um, essentially, if there's nine steps from dark to light, you need nine separate dye pots. Mm -hmm. uh, but you only need one small quantity of dye to dye all those. Uh, basically, uh, what I do is measure out a certain amount of powder and dissolve it in water. This happens to be half green dye and half blue dye. And I begin with two cups of that solution. And I put uh, a cup of that in the first dye pot. And that's going to be my darkest color. And you've got water in there. Right. There's water and salt in there already. Okay. Now I've got a cup left, so I add a cup of clear water to that. So I'm diluting this dye. So you really don't need to use a lot of dye no. to start out mm -mm. with. So now I take a cup of this stuff, which is only half as strong, and put a cup of that in the next dye pot. And then I'll add another cup of water here and so continue on. down the line, putting a cup of dye in, add a cup of water. Can you do as many steps as you want to sure, get? Sure, sure. Now at some point it gets so light that you don't start to see the differences mm -hmm. anymore. I find nine or ten is a good number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about these? These oh. are wonderful. <laughs> Aren't they wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> Looks like, did you do your shirt? Yes, I did it's my shirt great. and many others, too. Um, about five years ago, I needed to start making some changes. Something and new. Something new. And I um, started doing these scrunch dyed fabrics, essentially, which is, uh, in this instance, a half yard that you wet and gather up and then get it in a little ball. And then I just take a piece of nylon net and wrap it around that to contain it and keep keep those keep folds those in there, scrunches tie in a string there. around yeah. that, and then that goes in the dye pot. Um, I can't always predict exactly what the effect is going to be, but for me that's a lot of the fun of it right now is having that sort of chaos along with that order mm -hmm. and, and how those two work together in the quilts. And I really feel like it's given a sort of more uh, impressionistic feel to the work and it's sort of um, That's what I get when I see cuts some of the your hard work. edges of yeah. the geometry. D can you over dye this with silver? Sure, okay. sure. In fact, here was a sequence of oranges that I then um, over dyed, oh. scrunched, and over dyed. So I can I can work within a sequence. Those also. are great. And mm -hmm. what about these? These look like you've got well, right. Here. Well, this is the latest. Now is actually um, tying a pattern into the quilt into the fabric before. Dying it. In, in this instance, it, there were just accordion pleats uh, made in the fabric. It's, it's easier to do the pleating if the fabric's wet. And then I make, put clips in or maybe put ties in, and you get different effects. I mean, there was a tie, for instance. Mm -hmm. These are clip marks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the challenge for me is how do I then take this piece of fabric and work it with these? Because mm -hmm. for really the first time, I'm working with prints. Exactly, um, that you've made so it's, on your own. Right. It's a whole new set of considerations. You're making it me. harder for yourself, but well, more right. interesting, too. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. This, is yeah. this something that anybody can do in oh, their home? Oh, yeah. These techniques are so simple once you gather up this. I <laughs> trust you. <laughs> yeah. It's true. <laughs> and this is all 100% cotton paper? Yes, 100% cotton dyes the best. Okay. Thanks. You bet, Penny. You've heard it here, so <laughs> you can try it in your own home. This is one of the things that's really interested me about what's going on now is in the past, say, five years or so, I've noticed more and more artists, quilt makers, really trying to incorporate surface design, painting and hand coloring their quilt fabric in many ways. So I wanted to look at the work of some other artists, along with Jan, who are really into this surface design technique. I am looking particularly at the work of Chris Wolf Edmonds, who is from Lawrence, Kansas. She is using the square as a motif in her hand-dyed fabric. Her squares on squares almost seem to move in space. This series was done as a commission to hang in corporate offices. Elizabeth Bush's quilts begin as paintings. She works on painter's canvas, coloring with dyes, pencils, and paint. Sections are pieced together making abstract designs that suggest windows and blocked views. Embroidery and quilting add details and texture that complete the pieces. Elizabeth lives in Stonyton, Maine.
The dye that these artists are using is Procyon Fiber Reactive dye. It's the kind you see in ads in the back of quilt and fiber magazines, not on the grocery sh shelf. Here's Lenore Davis's Little City, which was built quite literally block by block. She started out with a large piece of white fabric and printed each of the squares onto the quilt using a three inch square block dipped in dark dye. Before the dark dye covered block was pressed onto the quilt top, she drew a design onto the block much like one draws with finger paint. Other details, such as the wonderful mock quilted feather border, were added with a paintbrush. Lenore is from Newport, Kentucky. Risa Nagin is a Pittsburgh quilt maker who uses delicate means to point out dramatic problems. Her fabrics, which she stains and paints, are those used for ball gowns and negligees rather than aprons and house dresses. Her tiny stitches in silk and golden threads speak of luxury. Yet her subject matter here is domestic violence, power, and subjugation, and the struggles that go on beneath a veneer of loveliness. I hope you can be with us next week. We're going to be reminiscing a little bit. Diana and Laura will be at the quilting frame, and we'll go back in time and see what it was like being in a quilting group 50 years ago. And then the artist David Sherm will tell us about his grandmother who was a quilt maker, but he's not going to tell you about her pet alligator. But if you remind me, I will. <laughs>